We all hope to be able to sing with the saints in glory that wonderful song. In order to do that, we want to be faithful here on this earth. I mentioned in the auditorium class or in the adult class this morning what was said in Titus chapter 2. Specifically, I want to refer to now verse 12. We looked at 11 and 12. But we see in verse 11 that grace came teaching. And notice teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We have mentioned this morning the matter of moral sins. We have pointed out that matters of lying murder, covetousness, all those things have always been wrong. That man as he is made in the likeness of God, in the image of God, that is his spirit, his inward man, has imprinted upon us what is the image of God, speaking mainly of moral matters. And if we're going to live the Christian life, then we must realize what Paul said, Titus and all faithful gospel preachers and Bible teachers must teach, that in living godly in this present world, then we will have to oppose what is immoral. We'll have to uphold the morality that is revealed in the Bible. And one of our greatest dangers is conforming to this world. And we're warned not to conform to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That transformation doesn't just happen. It comes because we want to change. We do not want to be the way people without God and without knowledge of the Bible who live totally for themselves on the level of the flesh live. No area where the danger of conformity is greater than in the area of morality. So Christians must be distinctive in the morals that guide their thinking and living. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.12, Let no man despise thy youth. So he was talking about something that was peculiar to younger people. But be thou an example. The pattern of your life can be seen of the believers, of Christians, in word, in conversation, your manner of life, your conduct, your daily walk, in charity, the love that you have, the kind of love you have, in spirit, in faith, in purity. We are, as I said earlier, not to be conformed, but we're to be transformed, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Peter says virtually the same in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 4. And that all begins with us becoming new creatures in Christ. Our old sins are passed away. Behold, all things become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We are children of God. We're in the church. The Lord added us to it. We were baptized into Christ. All of our alien sins were cleansed, washed away, Acts 22, 16, because we believed in Christ, repented of them, Acts 17, 30, confessed our faith in Christ. Thus, a great transformation took place. And godly morals will result in the world hating us. That's exactly what John said in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 13. He said, don't be amazed if the world hate you. Sometimes we say, well, I'm just amazed that happened. Or I'm surprised that happened. Well, John's saying if you live like the New Testament teaches, and that would particularly have to do with morals, do not be amazed if the world hates you. Who, who's the world? Well, there are those who live contrary in general, 
to the teaching of the Bible as the way we ought to live, but specifically when it comes to morality. Ethics is defined to be the principles that set forth what one ought or ought not do. When we use ought in a sentence, we're actually saying uh, something moral is involved here. Now, we spoke this morning about the sense of oughtness that comes from the likeness of God being imprinted upon our inward man so that all men have a sense of, well, it ought to be this way or it ought not be that way. So man has within him the ability to understand and the power of the gospel is designed to draw men by them honestly using their sense of oughtness. If you look at morals defined, it would be the actual conduct of a person, a moral life. Of course, that would be in accordance with certain ethical principles. You'll remember that in Matthew 23, verse 23, for example, that the Pharisees had left undone many things that they, the Scripture says, ought to have done. Now, the fact the Lord says they ought to have done it anchored it in a moral state. Paul spoke, or discussed actually, how men ought to behave themselves in the house of God. 1 Timothy 3.15, kind of life we're to live, being that we're children of God in God's family. And Paul even requested prayer that he might speak boldly, and then he says this, as I ought to speak, Ephesians 6.20. Well, when you consider the world and the morality, or the immorality, and sometimes the amorality, just no morals, no moral standard <clears throat> that existed. And into that world, Christ said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Then you're going to have to be bold. And you're going to have to know whereof you speak. And I want us to look for a moment, and I think we've referred to it earlier today, to Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. And I'll just read this begin with Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now, Paul remembers writing to the churches of Galatia. Thus, he writes part of the New Testament. Therefore, it applies to you and me if you're members of the church. He's saying, here's the way you dare not live. <coughs> then he will also say, here's the way you're to live. But he talks about the works of the flesh. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest or made known or revealed, which are these. Adultery. Fornication, any problem with that going on in the United States today? Uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. All the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Then he goes into what the Christian does bear out in his life is the way he thinks and lives. The fruit, the singular fruit of the Spirit has several component parts. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, which is self-control. He says, against such there is no law. Nothing forbids you in these areas. And they that are Christ are crucified the flesh and the affections and lust. Isn't that interesting? All these things that he says are the works of the flesh, because a person's baptized for the remission of sins, added to the church by the Lord, a new creature in Christ, those things are not cultivated any longer. They're cut off. That's what it means put to death. It means you separate yourself from that kind of thinking and therefore from that kind of action and the works thereof. So he says if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the spirit. Now I want to pause there because I'm going to spend uh, most of my time dealing with a brief consideration of these specific sins which are termed works of the flesh and thus we're dealing much with moral matters. 
I was thinking when I looked at this sermon, I had forgotten about this outline. And as I was going through some things, I found it. And I preached it over 20 years ago in Northeast Texas. But now I want you to remember the state of this nation 20 years ago. It wasn't the best in the world. And I want you to hear it in the light of the way things are today. So we want to give a brief consideration of these sins as we divide them into five categories. The works of the flesh we'll divide into five categories. There are three sexual sins, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. All three of these are prevalent in our nation today, and everything is uh, put out there by the media and everybody else saying that's just all right. Fornication is called recreational sex and all that kind of stuff. The word fornication comes from the Greek word pornea, and it refers to unlawful sexual intercourse. Outside the bonds of marriage. The word uncleanness, akatharsia, refers to impure deeds and words, thoughts, and desires of the heart. I like to me, they're ready for primetime television. Then there's lasciviousness, aselegia, and it refers to a type of behavior in which sensual desires are not restrained, they are not controlled. A character always eager and looking for wanton pleasures to gratify them as they see fit. <clears throat> Two of these sins have to do with godlessness, idolatry, and sorcery. The word idolatry from the Greek word idolatria, which sounds like it in Greek, is the substitution of anyone, as I said this morning, or anything for the one true God. Colossians 3 5. Sorcery, pharmakia, or witchcraft. The word literally refers to the use of drugs. <clears throat> and you can hear it, that we get our English word pharmacy from it. Then there are four sins of uh, personal hate or animosity. Enmities, strifes, jealousies, and wraths. The word envy, ekthri, or hatred, refers to all these negative feelings which are the opposite of brotherly love. The word strife, eris in the Greek, specifies the quarrelings that grow out of the lack of the peace that demonstrates, again, a lack of brotherly love. Jealousies, jealous, or selfish ambitions for things belonging to others. Wraths, thumoi, it's the Greek word, refers to fiery tempered outburst of anger which is easily provoked. These are things peculiar to the flesh. There are four sins of group animosities, factions, divisions, parties, and endings. Now, I don't know what there is about some people, but some people are happy to stir up a stink, as we want to say. They're glad when things are happening. Frankly, I like a congregation, like I think the Bible teaches it ought to be, where there's peace and happiness, as the Bible defines both among the brethren. I think if some people knew by leaving that they were going to create so much peace, they wouldn't have left. Factions, erythei, denotes a self-seeking pursuit of something by unfair means. 
divisions, dichotomy, have to do with disturbances which split groups apart. Parties, heresis, from a root word which means to choose, and it signifies choosing up sides to form parties. The word envy, phthonos, refers to malicious feelings which one can possess because of another's good fortune. I suggest to you this one can be as big a problem among members of the church, all of these four sins, as a great many others because they deal with state of minds and attitudes we have toward one another. And they're displayed in so many ways that are not good. And you can think about that in the definition of these Greek words the Holy Spirit had Paul use. Two sins have to do with intemperance or lack of self-control, drunkenness and revelings. Drunkenness comes from the Greek word methai, and it means not only drunkenness as we think of being drunk by taking alcohol, but any strong drink, and by strong drink, that which would cause you not to think logically, rationally, or exercise self-control. Revelings, komoi is the Greek word, are naturally listed along with drunkenness for carousing and boisterous merriment because they are characteristic of those who have been drinking strong drink of whatever kind it might be. And the word revelings refers directly to the dancing and partying which accompanied the worship of Bacchus, who is the god of wines, what they did when they had their flings back in those days. Simply put, no matter what some of our brethren try to do to set it aside, the use of strong drink as that term is used here is sin. No way in the world a person who is transformed, a new creature in Christ, with affection set on things above, seeking to bring, seeking to bring every thought and subjection to Christ, setting an example like Paul told Timothy to do, is going to encourage somebody to involve themselves in that which causes them to lose control of themselves. Then Paul simply says this, and such like. What does that mean? It means that the 15 mentioned sins are not exhaustive. Such like means things like what I have mentioned. They're wrong too. Paul's desire was to teach the nature of such things and to encourage men to repent of every one of them. And repentance is not saying, I'm sorry. It involves that, but it's not only saying, I'm sorry. It means that you're turning away from that kind of sin, that you're not going to practice it any longer, that it's not a natural part of your life. You're getting rid of it. Now, I suggest that by just going through there and looking at the definitions of those works of the flesh and categorizing them to better teach it and understand it certainly covers everything that's going on today, only it's even worse than it was 20 years ago or when I preached this kind of thing 40 years ago or 50 years ago. You know, some of us are old enough to where we can remember when the school system and when local governments and even the federal government, state governments, when most religious groups all backed up biblical moral living concerning marriage, there was a time, believe it or not, that if you went to court to get a divorce, you had to prove that whoever you were divorcing was guilty of adultery. That sounds even strange today with no-fault divorce, which means if I want a divorce, I just go down to the court and get one for whatever reason. The reason doesn't make any difference. So everything in our society has now worked the other direction. It cultivates and makes acceptable everything I've been going over 
regarding the works of the flesh. Some of us can remember when abortion was a horrible thing and that it was not the law of the land. And I well remember preaching over and over again when it was being fought out and discussed before the Supreme Court made the decision, preaching about it. I remember getting to a discussion in an open forum in the paper over this very thing. i got a little letter I may read sometime for you because I got kind of sarcastic in it. <laughs> but it brought my lesson across, I thought, pretty well about abortion. We can remember when counties actually would be dry counties. Do you remember when nothing was open on Sunday? I remember back at home, and if we got to buy a loaf of bread coming home from church, there wasn't any place to go buy it. They were all closed. What caused society to think that way and come up with those ideas? I'm not saying within itself it's automatically sin to be opening a business on Sunday if you're a Christian doing everything else God wants you to do on Sunday. So, so why? Well, it meant there was a respect, a very healthy respect for those things. You don't see that anymore. So think about what abortion is now, what it wasn't years ago. Think about how marriage is on the rocks and has been. Think about how divorce is any way you want it. And you can just go on. Think about the family in general. You know, I can remember in my class at school, I doubt there were two children whose parents had been divorced. There was a hundred in my class when we graduated. Well, find somebody today that hadn't been divorced. What is that saying, brethren, about the church doing its work in this society as we try to preach the truth? Well, back in those days, you primarily preached against denominationalism and showing what the truth was because guess what? Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians pretty much stood shoulder to shoulder on the same morals. That's not so anymore. So I go back to what I said a moment ago. Everything in society now is working rather than to uphold biblical morals is working right the opposite direction. And if we go out to try to teach the truth because we love souls and we want to see them saved, then guess what? We've got to be prepared to deal with the immorality that's out there in a way today that it wasn't back when I grew up. Now, that's not saying everybody was like they ought to be. That's not the point. The point is that in those days, coming from the basic institutions of society, biblical morals were encouraged and backed up. And families were still more along the lines of what the Bible teaches. And divorce was frowned upon. Well, who would have heard of abortion when I was 15 years old? Or even later. That's not the way it is now. And we still have the obligation to preach the truth and contend for the faith. So we're going to have to deal with these things. We say, that's, that's so terrible. Folks, look, Paul's writing part of the New Testament 2,000 years ago, and he says, here's what's out there in the world. And it's highly interesting. The Lord built the church in this society that Jesus came to live at that time because it demonstrates the power of the gospel over people like that. People can get just sick of these things. And it may be where we're going. I, I frankly hope it is. But I don't know how far down the road it'll go to people say, we're on the wrong track. You don't ever know. Besides that, you don't know when God may call the whole thing to an end and the world comes to an end. You don't know. And, and many will die and not change. I don't know whether you've watched the news the last couple of days or not, but up here in Montgomery County, there school policy, I won't name the schools, where their boys can't have their hair cut. I think it has to come down to about the collar. That's all, it's allowed. The boy can wear it that long. Well, there's some of them been wearing it down their shoulder blades. And that was just the straw that broke the camel's back or a door that opened to bring something else up. This one child, 11-year-old boy, hair down to about his shoulder blades. Most women love the hair. Head of hair that I saw on television. 
The mother's defending him. Because he doesn't know whether he's a boy or a girl. And they call him binary. You think there's a problem there emotionally or maybe mentally? And since the mother's defending him and trying to justify it, do you get an idea of where all that may have come from and the stability or the lack thereof in that home? And that's just one case. We have a work cut out for us if we're going to see the gospel spread and us preach the gospel and how we have to deal with people because they're out there and they're growing and there's more and more of them. Decisions are going to have to be made by people. So what you can do. Of course, there is the sin of homosexuality. And I want to just simply say the cause of this sin is not genetics. It's a moral problem. It's a problem that comes up because people don't have any Bible backing concerning male and female. God created them male and female, not male, female, binary. That, you know, these things would be hilarious if they were not so terribly serious. Well, godly families are going to have to train their children. They're going to have to teach their children. They're going to have to set a godly example. They're going to have to do some training in biblical morals. And you're going to have to realize what may be right next door to you and how you deal with it. I know what the biblical view is regarding homosexuality. I just turn over to Genesis chapter 19, verse 5, part of that book that was written before time for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4. And I look at Sodom. The word, K-N-O-W, no. In Hebrew, it's yada. And in the Greek, the word happens to be gnosko is sometimes used in the scriptures as a euphemism for to have sexual relations with. Genesis 4.1 and Matthew 1.25. And those angels that appeared as men, when the men of the city compassed the house of Lot, wanted to know those men. I'm thinking about as I preach this here, how many places if I were to preach just what I'm preaching now, I don't know what would happen to me. I don't know what would happen if we in the Church of Christ, or any other religious institution for that matter, pressed the moral teachings of the Bible regarding the sinfulness of homosexuality and that people who commit such things will lose their soul in hell. That God made man, male and female, created he them. And that man cannot change himself to a herself or herself to himself. When you look at the teaching of Jesus, marriage is for male and female, Matthew 19, 4 through 6. So when people talk about homosexual marriages, there is no such animal. And the state calling it such doesn't make it such. We must let God determine what these are. And so when the state says, well, you're divorced, contrary to Matthew 19, 9, or you're married, contrary to Matthew 19, 6, well, the state said it, and they can bring their powers to bind on you, but it doesn't change God's view. And it doesn't change the standard that will judge us all when we stand before him in the judgment. Fornication, pornea, as I said earlier, also covers homosexual relations. If you look at the book of Jude, you'll see how that's brought out very clearly in Jude 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, you can't preach the gospel nowadays to the public in general like it ought to be preached and not preach Jude on that point or any other passage that deals with it. <laughs> and Paul plainly rebuked homosexuality in Romans chapter 1. Homosexuality is a result 
of one thing, vile passions. Now, I mentioned this morning we have our natural appetites. We have a sense of oughtness. It's built in. But man has a free will, and he can go against those things. Paul will talk about women without natural affection. Does that mean that it's just gone from them? No, it means they've suppressed it. You cannot tell me that a woman can have natural affection and abort her baby. They've gone against it. They're without it. They've corrupted themselves. If a false teacher can sear his conscience to where he doesn't care whether he teaches the truth or not as long as he gets over what he wants for his own benefit, then you can change because you have that will. You can alter the way you ought to work. You can ruin your conscience. You can ruin it. It's the highest court of our being. It says, feel good, you live by the standard that's right. Feel bad, you violated it. Therefore, I must have the right standard. And it must be the right moral standard as well as the right spiritual standard. Then when I violate that standard, my conscience accuses me and my conscience pricks me. But if I go ahead and do what I know the standard that I believe to be right forbids me from doing, or I go contrary to what it authorizes, and I keep doing it, then I sear my conscience. I make it not work right. That's the power I've got over myself and you have over you. Homosexuality then is a perversion from the natural to that which is against nature. So Jude 7 calls it strange flesh. Male for male, female for female. And I don't know what a binary is. All I know is it's not biblical. It's a deranged mind. And that's going to be just part of what's coming out of this business. We used to deal with homosexuality, and that matters. But you see then that this gets over into all sorts of problems with kids. Think of the mental problems these kids are going to have. They already got them. Homosexuality results from lust, causing males to burn for males and females for females. You know, there's the possibility for any one of us that we can have a desire for something. But when I know from God's infallible, objective, absolute will, that's not pleasing to God. What am I required to do? Suppress it and get rid of it and separate myself from it. That's self-control. And it doesn't have to be matters of morality. It can be matters of religious that I think, well, I really like to do this. I really enjoy it. So let's just bring it into the church as a part of what it is to worship God. Well, I have no authority from Christ for it, so what do I do? I suppress it. I put it aside and say, not my will, but thine be done. And submit myself to the will of God. Jesus did that in the garden. Did he want to go to the cross as a human being? No. He said so. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But here's the key. An example for you and me. Not my will, but thine be done. He had to exercise himself to submitting his will to the Father's will, and that's faithful Christian living. We all have desires. All of us have the appetites of the flesh. And maybe some people have a stronger desire for something. I remember it said, and I believe it was Robert E. Lee, either that or Jackson, who said they didn't drink because they liked it too much. Well, I'd say that's a pretty fair evaluation of yourself. When you know something really appeals to you, but it's not good for you, just go ahead and get in it. Why well, no? You learn yourself, you see, because you look into the mirror of God's Word and see you as God sees you, and being fair with yourself and honest because you want to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then you don't let yourself do those things. And that's what some people just do not see in Christianity. That there is an exercise of my will to be in submission to God's will as set out in the Word of God. And that covers not only matters of morality, but matters of religion. Notice that homosexuality is called unseemliness. 
Homosexuality is also called error that was due recompense. Things that have to do with violating our nature have seemingly always drawn from God worse punishment than other things. I don't know all the reasons for that, but I think I know some of it. Because there's built into us, by being made in the image of God, a help to say, That's, that just is not right. You may not know exactly what you ought to do about it, but that just doesn't fit. And I'm not going to get involved in it. Now, you may have to go and study the Bible and understand better about things to understand how it really ought to be regulated. But there has to be a way that the gospel appeals to you. Why does the gospel, why does the word of God appeal to you to get you to change in matters of morals? Because you're made for it to work on you. When Paul wrote the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 9, 6, he used the word in the King James Version, effeminate, malakos. Especially has to do with what's called catamites, men and boys who allow themselves to be misused homosexually. And he says they cannot inherit the kingdom of God. They're responsible for it. They put themselves in that situation. They choose it. The Greek word, arsenkoites, from the word, compound word, arsen, a male, and koite, bed, literally, males in bed with males. You know, you think about speaking Greek, they got pretty plain, didn't they? Paul puts homosexuals in the same lawless category with murderers of parents, etc. But that's not what we're hearing nowadays. It's just an alternative lifestyle and all the other stuff that goes along with it. We are very much, if you're a faithful Christian and in a congregation of faithful Christians, an island in a very wicked world that goes further away from God all the time. Yeah, we're expected to be the light of the world. We're expected to be the salt of the earth. The leavening influence for good. When you think of people who are moral people, that is, they're influenced by the teaching of the Bible, God's will concerning what godly morals are, they actually are the soil into which the seed is sown, the Word of God, Luke 8, 11, that can best hope for germination and growth. We shouldn't get the idea that, well, if the world, we can just get the world morally right everything's okay no the lord knows better than that it takes the gospel to save and it takes the spiritual matters to save and we must be under the authority of christ and it's through him that salvation is offered by his gospel but a world that is moral according to what the bible teaches about morals is more apt to receive the seed and be honest with it and it germinates how serious is it to give oneself to the works of the flesh? Verse 21 of Galatians 5, I tell you before as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a nice way of saying you are going into torment if you are living this way when you die. In Chapter 6, in verse number 8. Well, we'll just go to verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Then he says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. I must be willing then to live on the level of the truth of the gospel of Christ, and my thoughts, my words, my actions, and my associations. What we're seeing in all of this round about us, nationwide, even worldwide in the Western world, is because people have moved farther and further away from God, from Christ, and from the Bible as the very word of the living God whereby men are to live. As to how long the church will remain what the New Testament says it ought to be, well, that's dependent upon people and their willingness to receive it with the proper attitude of mind and live it 
even though they must undergo great persecution. We must accept the Bible as the only true standard of right and wrong in spiritual matters as well as moral matters. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It behooves us as members of the church, children of God, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, members of the body of Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, to be sure that we're helping each other live like the New Testament says. We cannot neglect these areas. And when we talk about loving one another with brotherly love, then that love demands that we are mindful enough of each other in the church that we want to see each other living like the New Testament says. Because you can be sure as time goes on, these immoralities that are being acceptable, that are acceptable and being more acceptable every day, are going to touch more members of the church. Already, it's happened in marriage, divorce, remarriage. I had a lady call me the other day. It was, it was almost funny the way she said it. They were a small congregation in another state. She said, I wish we could just keep people come by here looking for the truth or are people that are open to the Bible said so everybody we get coming into the door to visit when they do come is some much weirdos. Said we had a man come by the other day and he was wearing a dress and he wouldn't know if we would accept him. He said the homosexuals won't accept me and other people won't accept me. Will you accept me? Well, I told her, I said, well you should ask him, will God accept you? Let's start there. Will God accept you in view of what you believe and how you're dressed? That's where we got to start. But when we do start that, and the opportunity to start it there more and more, uh, maybe more and more, then we may well expect what John said. Don't be amazed if the world hates you. To live the Christian life gets more and more, shall I say, tedious than ever because nothing around us is supporting and backing up the godly family raising children according to the will of God. The church is God would have it. Christian living is being frowned upon and openly opposed. And what I preach this afternoon in many, many, many places in this country will be very much opposed, made light of, and rejected, and even attacked. So let us rise up with a determination, no matter how few we are, to live totally by the whole counsel of God and then every opportunity be ready to teach people whatever sins they're in and showing them how to come out of it and how to come to Christ by the gospel. If you need to obey the gospel, now is a good time to do it. If as a child of God you sin, we urge humility and meekness and willingness to honestly see your sin, repent of it and confess it. If you need to do that now, we ask you to do so while we stand and sing.